and I'm going to do a really stupid thing, which is to try to do live demos in front of you. Some of them hot off the press, as in I got the last download about an hour ago. Uh, so I'm going to let it all hang out in the interest of showing you the latest and greatest. But there are perils with that, and one of them is that I need my own tablet computer in order to be able to do the demos. So please bear with me, and we'll start going through this. And you tell me when you want to switch video cables, OK? So I'm going to talk about when, under what circumstances, I think the pen is in fact superior to the standard WIMP interface that we all know and love, which is driven primarily by mouse and keyboard. But before I do that, I want to pay homage to the person for whom this lectureship was named, Sam Conti. How many of you know who he was, just out of curiosity? You young ones don't really, so I feel in his honor I should refresh you a little, because this was an extraordinary person. He was my host in 1965 when I was recruiting for my first position. As history shows, I didn't take the offer from Purdue and went to Brown instead. But I came away with a lasting impression of what a great guy this was and what a wonderful departmental culture he clearly was in the process of creating. He has many achievements to his name. But I remember him always as a, a gentleman and a scholar in the true sense of that word. He was one of the kindest, most helpful mentoring people I ever met and a terrific role model for me and for other people who had the privilege of knowing him. So I feel very honored to be able to be here and pay him a little bit of respect in memoriam. And there are some elemental facts about Sam. I also worked with him on revitalizing CRA. And uh, that's one of the places where your dean, Jeff Fitter, whom, by the way, I didn't recognize because he wasn't wearing shorts and sandals. I've never seen him dressed as a grown-up before. <laughs> uh, I uh, think Jeff also had a lot to do with helping to revitalize CRA, the Computing Research Association. Anyhow, uh, let me tell you what uh, we're about to try. What the essence of my talk is about, and that is the contrast between the kind of user interface that is embodied here, the WIMP interface with its myriad of widgets, buttons, and scroll bars, and things like that, and uh, what I'm going to show in contrast to that kind of user interface, which is primarily a gesture-based user interface. So here I have my admin's six-year-old, Nicole. And as you can see, she has a tablet PC in front of her. And she is writing music on it. And there isn't a single piece of WIMP interface in there, in fact. And uh, what I'll do now is switch video sources. Yes or not yet? OK, well then let me do the first demo to give you some sense of what this might be about. And in order to do that, I need to come out of I didn't have this set up properly. So hold on a second while I figure out where the hidden button is. OK. I'm going to minimize this and go to the first program that we did for tablet computing, which was Music Notepad. And it was an attempt to see how far we could push the gesture paradigm. So I'm going to just draw some simple things like these notes. And as you can see, everything is literal as I write them down. Didn't like that one, so I'll scribble it out, go up. Actually, I want that to be a half note. So I put a little gesture. You may have seen me flick to the left. And at any time I like, I can play that. Uh, can we up the sound a little now? It probably is going to kill the microphone. Did you hear it? And so on. 
and obviously, since I'm not really a musician, we can go to slightly more interesting music. And uh, if we took the time, we could get stuff of that complexity in there. So there are a few widgets at the top, but basically it's all based on gestures. And I'm entering both literal content, notes, and gestures such as race, uh, sharp, flat, uh, bar notes together, and do all the things that you normally do when you're trying to write music. So the idea is that you stay in the two-dimensional vernacular, the two-dimensional visual language that you're comfortable with, and that you're not forced to learn some relatively artificial linear language and to do the cognitive mapping that is required when you go from a two-dimensional language to a one-dimensional language. So that's the key idea of this entire lecture. And if that's what you carry away from it, you've got the point. <coughs> Any questions about what the goal is? Everything else now is elaboration. Stay in the two-dimensional vernacular that you're comfortable with and learn as few things that let the computer infer your intention as possible so that it's about making your time efficient, not making the computer efficient. Now, talking about all this in Purdue is in a sense carrying coals to Newcastle because you folks are among the very few universities that already are doing a lot of this. Dan was involved with this first project and then you've been running uh, a series of workshops on the use of this kind of technology in education. And they have proceedings, and you're running one in October. How many of you knew that this was going on in your very own university, out of curiosity? Wow, just a handful. See, so actually there's some utility in carrying coals to Newcastle if you're not burning coal. Now, what's the contrast between this gesture-based style of communication and WIMP interfaces? Let's examine the design center of a WIMP interface. When were WIMP interfaces designed, by the way? How old are they? 70s. Where invented? Park, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. And WIMP stands for windows, icons, menus and pointing. OK, that's the prototypical user of a WIMP interface. Take a good look. We have very limited vision. Monocular vision does fine, because there's no depth perception with conventional computer displays. We can't speak to them. So some modification in that, in that some of us, like me, are now using dictation programs to save our poor hands. Drag and dictate 9.0, get it. It really works finally. It only took 40 years for speech recognition to get to the point where it's usable. It is now. And for those of us with RSI, like me, it's really a good thing. Audio is very, very limited. You can't gesture at your computer because mice aren't very good for gesturing. Uh, 10 fingers on the keyboard or one, the system can't tell the difference because it's a finite state machine and it takes one keystroke at a time. There's no simultaneity. You get very little tactile feedback. And in fact, you can say the system doesn't know you exist. It reacts only when you do something, when you cause an explicit event and event handlers get to work. So where, in what sort of situations do pens make sense? Well, obviously for sketching, where you would normally do it with an ordinary pencil, number two pencil or a pen, lots of people know how to sketch. And even those of us who have no drawing ability whatsoever still use cocktail napkins or whiteboards to make simple diagrams and things like that. And there are these pre-existing visual languages that I've mentioned. As well, there's times when you don't carry a keyboard with you. A little lifestyle origami, for example, doesn't have a keyboard. PDAs come often without keyboards. And even when they have miniature keyboards that you thumb type on, it's often much more 
it's easy to uh, just use a little stylus on them. And here's an environment. We have a virtual reality cave, which is a, a little eight-foot room with walls that are projection surfaces. And you wear head track stereo so that you see things in true depth. And you're inside your molecule or walking, in this particular case, on the surface of Mars. And you can do 3D navigation with a six degree of freedom device like this, sort of a laser pointer. But sometimes it's much more convenient to carry a little tablet and look at a map, basically, a map of Mars, and sketch in the trajectory of how you'd like to walk on the surface of Mars, or fly over it, or teleport, whatever it is you'd like to do. So here we're combining 2D with 4D, and it works very well indeed. Now, there's a long history in this field. Tablet PCs may have been around for only four or five years, but in the very early days of interactive computing, starting with Ivan Sutherland and Sketchpad, which is probably the most cited PhD dissertation in our field, people have been working on the idea of capturing natural vernaculars. And the brother Sutherland, Bert Sutherland is hardly known, but he also made very important contributions, got us introduced to the notion of more natural ways of communicating with computers at a time when punched cards and batch processing still reigned supreme. So these were amazingly powerful contributions to interactive computing in general and not just computer graphics. And let me show you some others. Uh, OK, we seem to be having All right, this is the first tablet. The RAND tablet dates from the mid-60s. And interestingly enough, one of the very first applications that was put on it was a math recognizer. We asked Bob whether he still had a copy of his PhD dissertation film. He said he didn't know. He went into the attic and found it, and we digitized it and set it to music. And here, 40 years later, is his PhD work at Harvard. So he loved the little embellishments we made for him. Another inspiration of me personally, mine personally, and for a lot of our field and in interactive computing and window systems and so on, is the incomparable Alan Kay and his vision of the Dynabook. And these tablets are essentially incarnations of the Dynabook idea. We still have a long way to go for it to have all of the features that Alan wanted in this portable simulation engine, but we're getting better and better. Well, the second wave went beyond research and visioneering and said it's time to start implementing because we now have personal computers and we can make Dynabooks. And here's a whole bunch of things that are effectively early on Dynabooks. And which one of them survived? Really only two ideas. Graffiti, and even graffiti's use has declined precipitously over the years. And the Anodo camera pen, with which you can capture ink drawn on special paper that has digitizable coordinates in it and capture it for post-writing recognition, a batch form of recognition inside your computer. Well, we can now do a lot better than in the early 90s. Why? Well, because we have much more powerful hardware. Thanks to Moore's Law, we have much better digitizers. And we have much better software, because we have a lot more power in our CPUs. We can afford algorithms that were just unthinkable back then. And so one of the things that we've been using a lot is machine learning techniques, which are statistics-based and take a, a lot of crunching. So it really is time to go back 
and look at all those old ideas that people had starting in the 60s and see how we can make them more robust, more innovative, more mature, and ultimately more useful. So what do I mean by pen computing? Well, I want to be able to take advantage of the pen and to have it be more than just something with which I lay down a trail of digital ink, which is OK. So note-taking is a fine application. But in itself, to me, it is not a value proposition. A value proposition arises when you can do something more easily than you can with keyboard and mouse. And what might that be? Well, when you can do interpretation of the digital ink that you've laid down. Uh, to interpret notes or mathematical symbols or letters and words of written diagrams or diagrams themselves. And I think that the future lies, in fact, in combining speech and gesture recognition, speech and handwriting recognition, so-called multimodal interfaces. So I'm going to talk primarily about stylus-driven interfaces, but think about pen, think about the finger, and think increasingly about multi-touch. Uh, the Microsoft Surface is one of those. And actually, so here are here I this the gadget. I go to library and go to photos on different albums I've inputted from my computer. And I can see the photos. And again, if I turn it, it automatically rotates so I see it full screen. And you can also change the size of that picture? Oh, well, absolutely. Let's get to, here's, for example, two boys sitting at a tree. If I want to see them better, I can just. Grab it and zoom them in and position them. How many of you have seen an iPhone and played with one? Pretty slick, huh? Well, so there you have multi-touch in a commodity gadget, and that's going to do more to sensitize people to the fact that you can do better than standard WIMP interfaces than the tablet PC or any number of papers and talks about that subject. This will get in the hands of kids, and it will get them used to touch and gesture recognition and pointing in a way that the Mac and its successors did generations ago. It just becomes part of the common vocabulary. And that's a great advance as far as I'm concerned. Why do we want to do this? What are our goals? Well, transparency to me. Minimizing the cognitive distance, in other words, is, is foremost in my mind always. I want it to be as easy as pencil and paper, but with the power of the computer behind it. I want the best of both worlds. And I sometimes want it to run in batch, and sometimes I want immediate feedback as I'm gesturing and drawing. And as much as possible, build on what we already know so that we have to do less and less of this encoding of 2D information to 1D token streams for mathematics, for chemistry, music, and diagrams. And I'm going to show you examples today of all four of those. So the differentiator for digital ink is the interpretation, the assigning of semantics. So you can start, for sure, with just recording. And that's useful. But when you have 1D or 2D token streams, then the game becomes much more interesting. And now we have a legitimate alternative to WIMP interfacing. So we need to be able to do recognition of symbols and characters and of gestures. So graffiti is an early example of that. And I have to say, the other technology besides speech recognition that people have been working on for well over 40 years is handwriting recognition. I started life after college working on character recognition. And it was supposed to be another three, four years, and then we'd have commercial, robust <coughs> character recognition. Well, the three, four years, this is not atypical in our field, stretched out to become 40 plus years. But just in, 19, in 2006, I believe, speech reco finally were, went over the knee of the curve, the elbow of the curve. And so did character recognition for cursive handwriting. And Microsoft's recognizer is not half bad. It does really quite well, surprisingly well. So you use that as an ingredient in doing a much more difficult job of two-dimensional parsing. For, for example, in mathematics recognition, you can use the Microsoft recognizer for recognizing A and B and C and X and COS. But then it's up to you to decide that COS is COS and not C0S, for example. 
So you can use it as a building block in a much more sophisticated two-dimensional recognizer. And here are some examples of other two-dimensional languages that are being decoded and that can let you stay in your existing vernacular. And some more examples over here. Uh, I leave this essentially as a bibliography for those of you who are interested in pursuing this area, don't have time to talk about any of those. The largest area in pen-based computing turns out to be for 3D and not for 2D, and I mentioned some examples here. Our own work on three-dimensional sketching from the mid-90s and a sort of semi-commercial version that doesn't do as much inferencing as we did as Google SketchUp, which some of you may be familiar with. And then that was uh, fed into uh, Takeo Igarashi's work on Teddy. He spent a year and a half at Brown. And here was a uh, interesting project that I saw in a previous talk this past year, where sketching is used as input to 2D and 3D face animation. And uh, you can get the sketch mapped onto a cartoon figure in 2D or 3D and even get it to be animated. Quite cute. So I want to tell you now about some additional work that we do at Brown. And instead of spending a lot of time talking about it, I just want to show it to you. So here are some properties of the work we're doing. You can read that faster than I can talk about it. The key points are that we have a two-dimensional parsing problem. And in my introductory course, which I started teaching in the 60s, one of the assignments was build a two-dimensional parser for a simple visual language. Uh, that's when it was still possible to teach most of computer science in a one-year course. It's kind of laughable today that we thought we could do that. But in those days, there wasn't that much to teach. In any case, I haven't done that for a long time. But it's interesting that all that two-dimensional parsing stuff is back with a vengeance. And there's some nice new techniques for doing that. We do the parsing, which includes segmenting where the various pieces of information are. Uh, but what we don't do is the actual equation solving. That's a whole separate problem. And we let MATLAB or Mathematica do that for us as an appropriate back end. So here's kind of what it involves, and then I'll demo. We start with digital ink. We do some pre-processing, for example, to do normali normalizing for size and rotation and position. We filter out some noise. We look for a lot of cusps that may be extraneous and that cause problems. We segment the various elements based on where they are geometrically relative to each other. We extract features. We do classification and parsing, which is done with 2D grammars and a lot of statistical processing. And then finally, we arrive at some kind of understanding of what it is you're doing and feed it back to you, either in batch mode or on the fly. And I'll show you both forms. So let me now exit and actually demo some of this stuff for you. Uh, it's always a pain to find out where they hide this. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you Joe Laviola's PhD work. He's now an assistant professor at University of Central Florida. He wrote some of the very good papers in tracking systems for virtual reality. But then he beat me up and said, I'm tired of doing that, and I want to do 2D stuff, and being a hardcore 3D guy. I said, ah, oh, come on. You've invested three years in learning all of this good stuff. Are you going to throw that away? And he said, yeah, I'm tired of it, and I want to do something completely different that other people aren't doing already. I want to do math recognition. And I said, oh, must you? And he said, yes. And I said, OK, I'll give you three months. Build a prototype and prove to me that it has legs. And if it has legs, I'll support you to finish it. So he proved my intuition wrong built something that intrigued me. And now I'm a strong proponent and have a good-sized group continuing work in this particular area. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, draw an integral and say x cubed cos x dx. Okay, Nothing is happening. 
The system is just looking at the fact that I've recorded a bunch of digital ink. I now circle it, and I say, interpret that. It put a box around it, and you may have seen that it subtly changed the shape of each character to put it in the handwriting exemplar with which I trained it. And if I'm not entirely sure that it recognized it, I can put it in this ugly linear notation in that little box and make sure that it did recognize it, which it did. And what I'll do now is say, that's the gesture for, please give it to Mathematica, which will do the symbolic integration. And oh, by the way, let's graph it. Oh, well, this isn't a function, so how is it supposed to graph it? So that's the erase scribble. So let's make it explicitly a function, update what it's supposed to recognize, and now I'll graph it. So I did this little flick, and I got myself a nice graph, and it's a symmetrical function. And I'm kind of curious what might be going on there. So I'll change the coordinate scale, and I'm noticing it's doing something I wasn't expecting. So let's go out to 100 and see what it's doing. And what I'm noticing is that I'm getting this ringing exponential. So that's pretty interesting. Well, if y is a function of x, then clearly I should be able to do dy dx. Let's recognize that. Ask it to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. And sure enough, the derivative of the integral is the integrand. Now, this is ugly, of course. You don't want that linear thing. But I haven't found a student that I wanted to uh, have implement this in the same handwriting. But you get the general idea. This is 2D math recognition. And I can do other examples. But what I really want to show you is the thing that he earned his PhD for. Because this is a necessary but insufficient ingredient towards getting a PhD, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm going to show you what was really novel. I'm going to erase this. I'm going to pull in uh, some previously drawn mathematics, because it just takes too long to stroke it all in. And here you see a simple linear polynomial and a quadratic. And they're meant to illustrate constant velocity and acceleration. And let's pretend that I'm a ninth grade algebra teacher. And I'm trying to give kids who basically don't like mathematics, most of them, some geometric intuition about what the difference is between velocity and acceleration. So I'm going to do that by drawing a little diagram. I'm going to draw myself a little hypothetical roadway. I'm going to dimension it. I'm going to circle the 200. And it's written very close to something that looks like a horizontal line. So the system says coordinates written to next to horizontal lines or vertical lines or diagonal lines are very likely to be labels. So it said, let's label that line with 200. And you'll notice, can you see the pink ink? Is that visible from there? The number 200 and the line are coated with pink ink. That's pretty translucent. So I drew myself a little car. I'm going to circle that digital ink. I'm going to tap on the boundary. And now it's a gesture that says, don't interpret it, but group it. It's a grouping operator, as opposed to a signed semantics operator. And what I'll do next is say, that's m. And I want you to interpret m, but in association with this group of digital ink over here. OK, didn't recognize that. So let's see what's wrong here. OK, now. You notice multiple things happened. The M got boxed, and the bitmap that it was associated with, that's all digital ink is, uh, went back to the mathematics. And the program did a recursive descent to say, what do I know about M? Any M in this bunch of mathematics? Yes, indeed. M is a function of T. Well, what's T? And T is this iterator. It's not mathematics. It's a little bit of pseudocode added to the math. And it says, yes, I know what t is. It's going to be iterated. OK, I'm going to do this again. So here's another car with a flashing blue light on it. And that is the police car.
Oops, didn't recognize it. So one more time. And now courtesy of MATLAB, I run them both. And what we see is that the cop car starts off more slowly. This function is 0. Uh, but eventually, he does catch up. And the question is, when is that? I did my little graphing gesture again. Here are the lines. And I'm wondering, when is this acceleration curve going to intersect the velocity curve? Well, let's go out to 20, say. And the answer is, oh, at 10. Oh, well, this is not pre-stored. So I go back and I say, reinterpret that, run the simulation again. And now we'll see that the cop car stops just in time to be able to hand me my ticket. So we have a number of these guys. I'll show you one more that's a little more up your alley. Okay. And Uh, I'll dimension this to 2, and we'll run that. And what I should have done is turned on, oh, I'm in the wrong program. What do you know? Sorry. Uh, I need, bear with me while I search for this. There we go. OK. What it's going to do, I'm running short of time, so maybe I won't even get a chance to show this. OK. What it's going to do is does this little orbital mechanics program for the initial conditions that I have set. It actually does a nice circular trace. I turn on a little uh, trace of breadcrumbs, and you show that it's a circle. And then I change the initial condition just very slightly of the planet orbiting the sun, and all of a sudden it makes this very intricate Lissajou pattern. And so you get to see how initial conditions really affect things. Let me show you one other little bit of work we're doing in mathematics, and then I'll skip a whole bunch of PowerPoint slides and go directly to my next demo so that I don't keep you here overly long. Uh, any questions, by the way? Interrupt me at any time, ask questions or argue or. Yeah. Cynical, you're a professor. <laughs> exactly. It's not robust enough. This is all prototype software. And there's only one program in the suite of programs that I'm going to show you that we considered sufficiently robust to be able to test it with students under battlefield conditions. And that's the chemistry program that I'll do right after this. We tested that with 250 students over the last three years, and it holds up remarkably well. We've put it on the web. Other people have used it. And it stands up pretty well. Math recognition is far harder. It's much more fragile. And uh, it's not ready for prime time yet, but we spun out a little company called Fluidity Software with the same people who worked on this software. And they're building a 9 through 12 tool called Fluid Math that they're starting to test with high school teachers. And the emphasis there is on less functionality targeted to those higher grades of high school, but much more robustness. Answer your question? Yeah. It's hard to do. And I want to remind you that it took 40 years for handwriting recognition and speech recognition to mature. I don't think it will take 40 years for this stuff. At least I'm praying it won't. Maybe five years, though. And there's still a lot of hairy research issues, which I hope to get to at the end. OK, so let me show you some other things. 
One of the interesting questions that we always have is, uh, how do you fix something that's in progress of being recognized? So I'm going to show a different style of interacting with mathematics. Previously, as you notice, what I did is I just wrote and wrote and wrote. And when I was finally ready to have the recognizer go to work, I circled it. And Microsoft Math works the same way. You write things in a little pad. And when you're ready, you submit it to the recognizer. And we wanted to try something that was far more interactive. So what you're going to see here is that as I write this stuff, it recognizes it on the fly and tries to do the best job it can. And it changes it, its mind. Now, this 2 uh, is not really a Z as it thought it was. So you'll notice that it's given me a list of alternates. And it said Z was what I thought you meant. And I'm going to say no. In fact, 2 is what I meant. So push 2 higher up in the pick list. And from now on, it will take this symbol. And in addition to recognizing the standard loop B2, it will take this as 2 first and Z second. And I'll train it that I'm going to write a crossbar through my Zs to make it really easy. But at least this time, I caught it. And so one of the other things I can do is to say, oh, you know what? I didn't mean for that to be a superscript. I meant for it to be in line. No, actually, I meant for it to be a subscript. And as you notice, I just drag it into place and do the appropriate thing. And I actually did mean it to be a superscript. And what I can do now is say, well, what is that? And it says, don't know what it is. It's just x squared plus 3x minus 4. And then I can say, well, how about making x equal 5? And now you can interpret it. So this is continuously live. It continuously tries to figure out what you do. And if you type C, it will take a best guess and say it was C or left paren or whatever it chooses. When it does something that it can see as either an O or a 0, then it says, hmm, maybe the next thing I'm going to see looks like an S. And if it is, then it says, OK, you must have met cos. And an integral starts off maybe being an S. And then when it sees a dx, then it says, ah, integral or if it sees that you put in limits. There's lots more here. I'm running out of time. I just want to show you that we've played with a variety of ways of giving you instant feedback. Some of it is to typeset it on the fly. Some of it is to write it small underneath, which we prefer most of the time, or larger underneath. Different people like different things. And one of the research issues that I'll mention at the end is, what do you show when? Some people want on-the-fly feedback, even if it means continuously correcting what you get. Other people are perfectly willing to fill an entire page with stuff and then say, batch recognizer, go to work. OK, any questions about that? All right. So we're still in the process of working with this. By the way, we handle. Uh, Integrals, obviously, with symbolic integration or numeric integration. Uh, we do simple derivatives, uh, trigonometrics, matrices, matrices with ellipses in them, and other stuff. No time to show them. I want to show you some of the other cool stuff. So the next thing I'm going to do, skipping out on my slides, is show you some chemistry. So. I assume most people here are not really chemists. I certainly am not. But I bet you've heard about organic chemistry. How many people know that it is a bear of a course and a killer of pre-meds? See, that prejudice is widely held. I, of course, make no judgment, but I know I could never pass that course. One of the reasons is it has infinite memorization. And the other reason is that you're required to do something that not very many people are good at, which is to take a two-dimensional structure diagram with symbolic letters and more or less straight lines that indicate bonds. And you're supposed to visualize it as a three-dimensional molecule. Because the three-dimensional 
Geometry, not just the topology, but the geometry, is crucial to understanding how that molecule works and how it will interact with other molecules when you add reagents, heat, or whatever it is you're going to do. That's very tricky. So we wanted to build a tool. Uh, this was originally advocated by a student of mine was a hardcore computer scientist, and then she decided she wanted to become a pre-med. She took an orgo course, loved it, but she was one of the very few people who did, and she understood why all the other people taking that course hated it as much as they did. And she said, boy, I bet I know what to do about that. So I'm going to draw, and I'm going to draw in this abbreviated notation that these guys use. And here is a molecule. And I think there's one other one coming out here. OK, this is a very abbreviated notation. Any place you see those little diamonds are carbons. And then you're supposed to know, because you're taught that, that there are as many hydrogens as you need in order to comply with the valence rules. So those are hidden. And what I'm going to do now is circle that for recognition, get the underlying molecular mechanics engine that my PhD student, Dana Tennyson, implemented. He's working on Rev2 now, which is far more sophisticated. And using the heuristics of chemistry, he comes up with a confirmation, a feasible confirmation, which I can rotate now and can examine in all of its three-dimensional glory. But wait, there is more because, of course, I can zoom in and out. That's obvious. But what I can also do is to examine the bond angles and to understand that the conformations are based on a minimum energy computation. So what I can do is say, pick that bond as an axis of rotation and ask for an energy curve, which is this red thing. And you'll see a little asterisk at the bottom there. And if I take this functional subgroup and rotate it about this bond, you will see that little asterisk. Do you see the asterisk moving along the energy curve? Is that visible from where you're sitting? OK. So this is a state that it likes. That's a minimal energy configuration. This is a maximum energy configuration that it doesn't like. So you can play with it and get a greater understanding of exactly what's going on here. Another thing that we're doing, and this is much harder even, is starting to work on reactions. And one of my computer science students, who is now my master's student after being an undergraduate and an undergraduate teaching assistant and head teaching assistant for me, also has a love for chemistry. And he decided that he wanted to do about something about the problem of having to memorize reactions. So reactions are things that take a molecule or several molecules from one state in what I think of as a monster finite state graph to another state through a number of intermediate states. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? And there are hundreds of them. I saw his cheat sheet, which was for a small portion of the course, and it was bewildering in its complexity. So what we want to be able to do is to let students experiment with this. So what I'm going to do is pick one of these reactions that I'm given a choice of. And what you can see is that you have the ingredients of the reaction on this arrow. And you have a transformation from a single bond to a double bond. This is a different molecule. And if I were to look at it like that, it would look different from the original molecule. And then the idea is that you'd be able to follow your way through a chain of these transformations, picking the reaction that you're interested in at any given point. Any questions about this? So it doesn't solve all of the problems, but it makes it a lot easier for especially the poor performers in the class to get some extra time on task, to get some extra help in a very specific way to help them over their learning difficulties and do a better job on getting through the quizzes and ultimately the tests. And we've shown statistical significance with this stuff. So that's a very good thing indeed. OK, let me go back to 
my slides after having skipped a whole bunch because I want to show you some additional things by way of points on slides. And then I have a couple more programs that I also want to talk about, or at least one more. So one of the, by the way, the, the synchronization problem seems to have completely disappeared. How odd is that? Pardon? It was the light interfering? Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> OK, then. Um, so I've shown you this, actually. This is another thing I won't have time to show. But it's where we're going with this whole mathematics stuff. It's one of the directions, in any case. We want to create pseudocode that has embedded mathematics. And we can now recognize this kind of stuff that says x and y lie in this interval. And this is actually a little algorithm that does extended arbitrary precision arithmetic. And you can see there are ifs in there. There are comments. There are output statements. There are ranges. And it's mathematics plus flow of control to make a much richer language. And ultimately, what we'd like to be able to do is to give people in specific problem domains, more of the stuff that they need to express algorithms in that domain so that they don't just have mathematics and C++ as their two alternatives, or mathematics and MATLAB increasingly more common, but that they can stay in this sort of enhanced mathematics vocabulary. And we're working on that under sponsorship. Let me skip through all of this stuff because we've done it. That's a piece of his state graph that I was talking about. OK, some other things we're experimenting with is diagramming, because everybody does diagrams. So we want people to be able to sketch rapidly and then have it prettified and have some intuition about geometry as well to lend itself to animation. And here's a very short little video that uh, Talks so this about. video is going to show a couple of different templates that I've implemented. Here you can draw a bunch of boxes and then recognize it. You get a set of boxes with some widgets for controlling them. You can also type text into them or you could write it. Uh, didn't want to get into the recognition issues right now for handwriting text. So a related template would be instead of drawing those as separate boxes, you can draw one big box and draw division lines through it and then recognize that and get a similar structure. Without changing any modes, if you draw different things, such as uh, triangles and divisions, you get a different template matched. You can draw that triangle again as a triangle in one stroke, and then put the division lines and get your template. Another template that's active deals with circles. So here we can draw some concentric circles. Recognize that, get some widgets for adjusting it. Or you could draw interlocking circles and get widgets for changing the relative placement of the circles. Here's a different type of diagram where you're drawing boxes connected by lines. Again, no mode switches, recognize that. Another variant of that kind of a diagram is drawn in different uh, orientations. Here it's a vertical, and we introduce some circle shapes. And that's a flavor of what can be done without too much effort. How many of you have used Smart Art in PowerPoint out of curiosity? OK. How many of you have heard of it, have seen it? Not very many. OK. PowerPoint now in uh, Office 12 has a set of about 100 sort of classical templates from which you can pick and make it much easier to draw a fairly nice diagram. But you're restricted to that vocabulary. And what we're trying to do is, first of all, not make you cruise through 100 different options, but to draw what's in your mind without really having to think about it. Cocktail napkin sketching is really what we're still after. And uh, another project that we're working on, if any of you are interested in building pen-based software, 
is we're trying to factor out the commonality that we've seen in a lot of our applications. Music notepad, chem pad, math pad, and a bunch of other pads that other people have created. And to try to create a higher level of middleware. So that's called star pad, where star is the wildcard character. And if you're at all interested in that, go on to our website, which I'll display at the end of this talk, which is in about three minutes. And uh, then you may be able to contribute and or build on this middleware layer that we're working on even as I speak. So what I want to do now is to leave you with a few minutes worth of research issues. And then I'll do one optional demo of our uh, uh, sort of futuristic version of PowerPoint uh, after people have had a chance to leave for other appointments or the TGIF that is awaiting them. Uh, today is Monday. I guess that would be a little early. <laughs> so a research problem is how you deal with users. Because remember, this is all about making users more productive and having them work more fluidly than they can with a keyboard interface. And it's very hard to persuade people to use new technology. So you got to decide what is your design center. Do you want to be for experts where they can safely be assumed to uh, be a, a one week or a one month learning period? For example, how long does it take to train people to be good Maya users with a conventional WIMP interface? Any idea? Maya is a 3D modeling program used in the special effects industry. Answer six months to a year. Well, we're never going to get away with that, with gesture-based computing, right? If it takes more than a couple of hours, most people will probably balk. So still, do you want it to be instantly accessible, like Music Notepad? You show that, or you show the chemistry to people, and literally, the learning curve is five minutes long. It's very attractive, because you can't do much in either of those. The mathematics is much more sophisticated, much longer learning curve. The more gestures, the more you can express yourself in a sophisticated way, the longer the learning process. So where do you want to be? And how do you disclose what the system is capable of? What I didn't show you in the music notepad, for example, is a tutorial in which you imitate what you see in a, in a staff above you. And it shows you how to make the gesture. You imitate it. And if you're at all confused on what to do, you click and you go directly to the manual where we talk about that gesture and how you execute it. And that's one way of disclosing what the system is capable of, a set of follow me and imitate me exercises. But that may not be the best way. At the user interface, we always have to make this almost commercial kind of decision. Do you want to go in competition with an existing interface, or do you want to subtly enhance an existing interface by putting some new features in? How many of you are comfortable with keyboard shortcuts, for example, in word processing? Yeah. So those aren't necessary, and most users do not use keyboard shortcuts. Computer people tend to, because they're used to that from being trained with Emacs where you press down four keys simultaneously to get a special effect. But ordinary users go to menus. I cannot teach my wife and many other people how to use those shortcuts, because they're not natural. They'd rather rely on menus. So we need to find tricks to seduce people into learning gesture shortcuts. And that's no easy proposition. I've mentioned the feedback issue. It's a wonderfully rich issue that underlies or is underlied by perceptual and cognitive psychology, uh, ergonomics, and situation-dependent uh, human factors, in a sense. Because it may vary how you want your feedback, but you always want to know where do you want your feedback, what do you want your feedback to be, and when do you want it. So I showed you in the mathematics what we've been converging on is in real time and small underneath what you're writing. And as you add additional material, the typeset version gets pushed down. So it's always out of the way. And that seems to work pretty well for most people. But some say, I don't want that. I don't want to be interrupted visually until I'm completely done. Fine. You should be able to have that capability. 
And one of the things that we don't do enough in computer science is experiment with next generation machines where we can try out new ideas that can take advantage of the full computing and display power, even though it may not yet be ready to be commoditized. Speech needs to be added, and for a lot of people, especially those with the luxury of private offices, you can do much better if you simultaneously recognize speech and gesture than with either one apart. I love this particular research problem because it appeals to a whole set of design skills. We're not going to be able to come at these problems just as computer scientists. We have to have some understanding of perceptual and cognitive psychology. And we also have to have an understanding of design in the sense of graphic design, because we're in the business of designing visual languages, which are partially existing notation, like math and music, but partially enhanced with whatever we want to add. So we don't have to be satisfied with music or chemistry or mathematics as it is. We can build a super subset of those notations. And that's a very interesting composite design task that is multidisciplinary. So it's very useful to have computer scientists hook up with people in cognitive science, in the arts, and work on things other than game design, where most people think that intersection lies. Well, there are lots of individual techniques that are really hardcore computer science which have to do with assigning semantics in a statistically meaningful way, being able to do backtracking, being able to figure out what's where on a page that has some chemistry here, and some math here, and some music here, and some plain text here. How do you separate that all out, and how do you get domain-dependent recognition to work? And a very simple problem, but it comes up all the time, is I lay down a little bit of digital ink. What did I mean? When I did that scribble gesture, did I mean scribble the last thing out that was near it, that was underneath it? Or did I mean this complicated piece of ink that should survive by itself? So we've experimented with special strokes that you can't overload, or with punctuation, where if you mean the thing to be interpreted as a command, then you have to tap on it or near it. And this is still open, exactly how you distinguish literal ink from symbols from gestures. So three possible interpretations for anything you do. And the gesture itself may be overloaded, depending upon what context it occurs in. Sometimes when we lasso, we mean select this and just make a digital ink. Sometimes we mean recognize it. Sometimes we mean associate it with something else. So this is pretty complicated stuff. It's neat. And how do I give people a chance to define their own gestures and shortcuts? Macros, if you like. How do I do that? Unclear. Well, the hardware is still not what we want it to be. And I'm waiting for this stuff. Digital paper or e-paper. Full color, high resolution. I can roll it up in a bundle, stick it in my back pocket. It's coming. They've got simplified versions of this already, and it's pretty neat technology. Uh, light uh, organic LEDs is one of the technologies that you're going to see a lot. So a lot of magic is going to happen on the hardware front, but it sure isn't there yet. And that means that these Laptop devices that act as tablets are quirky. They're not as robust as they ought to be. They're too heavy. They have poor battery life. They have parallax problems. Just the same, they're entirely usable at this point, unlike five years ago. Here's an important issue that computer scientists always ignore. You've got to test this stuff. You just can't build a prototype and say, I'm in love with it. It's great. You've got to test it, and you get outside observers to tell you whether it's great. It takes a lot of work to design experiments and to have them be meaningful. And we've spent a long time learning how to do it, and I don't think we're there yet. So I think one of the things that computer scientists need to learn is how to conduct experiments and how to have them be valid with whatever user community they're working with. 
And one of the problems with that is no one is actually willing to pay for people to learn it or for people to do it in a research project, except if your publication venue is uh, HCI or something like that, CHI, Computer Human Interface folks. And here's the biggest one of all, and no one is working on this anymore. Once upon a time, there was a company called Go, and they featured an integrated platform in which the OS and the applications were all integrated, and you moved smoothly depending upon what field your pen was in from one application to the other, because they recognized that now you were in words, and now you were in diagrams, and now you were doing file retrieval, and it worked to a very pleasant degree. Today, we're right back to where we've always been, which is application silos. You're in Word, or you're in PowerPoint. They're separate application. You have a limited amount of embedding of one and the other, but it's not seamless, it's not transparent. And part of what's wrong is that the operating system really is very old-fashioned in terms of its view of what the world looks like. To, op to operating system world, consists of applications and threads of control and things like that. And we want to be able to have fluidity and the minimum of boundaries and let the system interpret what it is you're doing at any given time. It's a very difficult research issue. Well, here are some resources. Uh, we have a wiki that you're encouraged to go on to. If you do pen computing and brown in Google, you'll get to it. There are conferences, your own. And we ran a workshop in March for which a transcript is available on our wiki. And there was just this now three-year-old conference on the West Coast in conjunction with SIGGRAPH. And uh, these are among the vehicles that we have for creating a community of developers, researchers, and users that will help and advance this nascent field. So even though we've been at it for 40 years, it's still sort of in the Kitty Hawk stage. And it will get better over time. And you just have to have faith that it won't take 40 years this time. I think this will get here well within five years. For certain kinds of applications, it's here already. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>